Good morning, everyone, and uh, good afternoon and good evening to those of you who are joining us from different time zones. My name is Zoe Marks, and I'm on the faculty at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm also a proud member of the Executive Committee of the Center for African Studies. And I want to welcome you uh, to our discussion today on the Africa and COVID-19 webinar series. We're talking today about the impact on women um, of both COVID-19 and the pandemic response. And I'm honored to be here with distinguished guests and colleagues. Um, and of course, to all of you who are joining us, thank you for bringing your expertise, insights, and curiosity to the conversation today. So as you can see on the slide on the screen, hopefully we've got um, some updates on the latest data from the Africa CDC. The Africa CDC is the co-host of this webinar series with the Harvard Center for African Studies. And we are now, we believe, in our 16th webinar. Uh, this conversation has been going since the pandemic was announced, and we've been closely following uh, the major themes, tensions, and challenges facing countries across the African region. The goal of our conversation is to provide an accurate depiction of COVID-19 in Africa. And so what we have with us today is a panel of distinguished experts, um, all of whom are at the top of their field in their respective positions. And we'll get a, a sort of multidimensional and um, interdisciplinary approach to thinking about what is unfolding on the continent and how different countries, communities, and localities are engaging with this multinational response to the pandemic. After we hear from the panel discussants, we'll also open up the floor for questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A function on Zoom. You can ask any questions that you want answered by the panelists via this typed in Q&A function. Um, if you're not seeing it on your screen, if you're coming in by a phone, I suggest you tap the screen and you should be able to see some of the controls for Zoom. Now to begin, we'd like to start by asking you a question. Um, there should be a poll coming up and what this poll is getting at is this idea that um, any crisis is also an opportunity. There is both danger and a juncture in the Chinese symbols um, for crisis. And we wanna know what you think about the COVID-19 pandemic and the pandemic response. Is it more likely to harm women and entrench gender inequalities? Or is it likely to lead to positive gains for women? Are there opportunities for gender equity in the pandemic and its response? In which direction do you think African countries and societies will travel? Very bad for women and gender equity, maybe slightly bad, the same, no change, better or very good for women and gender equity. And while you mull over your response to that question, uh, we'll show you the results in a few minutes. I'm delighted to introduce to you our guests. So to, to lay the groundwork, it's worth mentioning that women have been in many ways disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, whether we're looking at the health effects, healthcare and the economy, or facing a dual burden of crisis at home, having to um, pick up a, a sort of larger care burden for children, for the elderly, receiving diminished wages as that pulls uh, women and, and girls out of work, out of school, and facing threats of gender-based violence in the home and in communities that are facing lockdown stresses. So um, to first introduce the panelists and then come back to the poll, I'm honored and delighted to be uh, welcoming back to Harvard, Dr. Pimzile Mlagu Muka, who's the United Nations Undersecretary General and Executive Director of UN Women since 2013. Pumzile brings a wealth of experience and expertise to this position, having devoted her career to issues of human rights, equality, and social justice. She has worked in government and in civil society, also with the private sector, and was actively involved in the struggle to end apartheid and achieve democracy and justice in her home country of South Africa. Next is Dr. Marlene Temmerman. She's the chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Aga Khan University Hospital in Nairobi, Kenya. She's also the director of the Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health East Africa at the Aga Khan University. As an obstetrician, she supervised over 18,000 births in many parts of the world. Her interest is women's health and women's rights, and she has over 500 publications and books in the area of women's health. She also supervises and mentors PhD students in Europe, Africa, Latin America, and China, and has several awards and honors that she's received over her career for this work. 
Our last uh, panelist that I get to introduce to you today is a Harvard Kennedy School alum. Ms. Kosi Antua Yanke Aye is the first female executive director to head the National Board for Small Scale Industries, an agency under MOTI, the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Ghana. Prior to this role, Kosi had years of work experience in the United States, Europe, and across West Africa. Her experiences range from working as a consultant and an entrepreneur to a banker at Deutsche Bank, Citigroup, Merrill Lynch, and UBS. And as I mentioned, she's a graduate with a master's in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School. So Li Ming, if I could invite you to share our poll results. Um, we'll start with the audience feedback and then we'll, we'll kick it to our panel. Right, so I'm delighted to see that uh, basically one in five of our audience members do think that this pandemic might be a portal to borrow our and Betty Roy's um, description, a, a portal for women and gender equity. 20% of you suggested that it could be a positive opportunity, but uh, more than 50% of you think it will be bad or very bad. In fact, 60% of you think that this is going to have a negative impact on gender equity across Africa. And about 20% of you also think that things will stay the same. And so with that in mind, I, I'd like to kind of invite our panelists um, to tell us what you're thinking about this kind of this puzzle this opportunity and this and this crisis um, so we'll we'll take the poll down for now and, and begin our discussion um, so as i mentioned women have been dispor disproportionately impacted by the impact of covid 19 um, in a couple of key ways there's the increased care burden that's affecting women whose children have been sent home from school temporarily over a long duration, the caregiving responsibilities for the elderly um, and others who are unable to spend time out of the house as they normally would, and then diminished wages from government imposed lockdown measures. All of this stress um, has also pushed governments to try to think creatively and innovatively about how to help first responders and healthcare workers, the vast majority of whom are women, um, and also to think about how to alleviate some of the pressure on society, thinking about what uh, the kind of mandate and opportunities are for social protection. The fact that entire communities can still function, even in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, is probably due in many ways to the efforts of women. Women have been at the forefront of leadership and pandemic response from the highest levels of government, down to the very front lines of um, healthcare support as nurses and doctors and other healthcare workers serving people who've been affected by COVID-19 personally. 70% of nurses in Africa are women and we must praise, protect and empower them, the UN Under Secretary General said, she's with us today. They often are taking care as well of sick relatives who may not be ill enough to go to hospital. The COVID-19 pandemic is um, threatening years of gender equity progress. And so in our conversation today, we wanna to talk about some of those threats to progress while also really trying to focus on the opportunities and the policies that we should be pushing for that ensure social protection and gender equity in our pandemic response and in the societies we continue to build and strengthen going forward. In conflict settings, IDP camps and health sectors, women are facing in some ways an undue and extraordinary risk compared to their male counterparts. And there's been an increase in the number of domestic violence incidents, even those that are reported, never mind those that are going unreported. There seems to be risk of increased stigma and discrimination, not only for those who've been affected by COVID-19, but also for minority groups and um, others in the community who are seen as being somehow responsible for COVID. And the reports have forecast a downturn in access to sexual and reproductive health services, something that's particularly um, important to Dr. Temmerman, but also to women around the world. Women and girls are expected to be disproportionately affected because of this lack of access to healthcare, reproductive support and information, and also forms of financial and social protection that give women and girls some degree of stability um, in normal times. And if denied, it can it kind of heighten vulnerabilities and marginalization. There are moreover anecdotal concerns growing that changing access to school reproductive health care and work are leading to an increase in early and unplanned pregnancies, which if true and observed in African countries could have knock on effects for um, the next generation. So we know that women were already doing an average of three times as much unpaid care and domestic work as men, three times. 
um, including the majority of childcare. Lockdown orders and school closures, as I've mentioned, have disrupted and in some ways exacerbated this imbalance. So my first question to the panelists is what have you seen with regards to the gender balance of care work in response to COVID-19 and the pandemic lockdowns? To what extent have men taken this opportunity to expand the work and contributions they make at home and in the domestic sphere, perhaps even in their uh, micro communities? And to what extent is that burden falling on women? How are women and men differentially impacted? And I'd like to begin with Pumzile, um, and then we'll go to Marlene. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, good morning to everybody who is on the call. Um, well, you know, the burden of care has always been disproportionately uh, falling on, 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 on women's shoulders. And uh, with the pandemic, it increased sharply. And maybe I should also just start by saying there is no uh, gender neutral pandemic. And this uh, pandemic is also not different. And women in, in these uh, pandemics are not affected uh, mostly by more than men by the disease itself, but by the circumstances surrounding the way uh, the response is, is, is handled. And, and of course, the uh, exposure to underlying problems. So in the case of, of, of the burden of care, because women are, are the ones who have always been shouldering the bulk of unpaid care, with the school closure, uh, which is uh, those little things are a real burden uh, called children, uh, that created a lot of challenges for, for women and parents uh, with small children. And working from home uh, also meant that there were no boundaries between home uh, and, and, and work. And women uh, have complained to us that uh, when you are both on Zoom and the child needs something, guess who has to mute in order to run and sort out the, the problem. So yes, the burden of care uh, uh, has, has, has increased. And in the long term, we really have to move fast with the policies that uh, redistribute and regulate uh, the burden of care on women, which include infrastructure provision. And in our post uh, Beijing 25 work that we're doing now uh, under the theme and, and the campaign Generation Equality, which is trying to close the gaps and, and the unfinished business of the Beijing, the issue of care has become so strong. And I have to say, I'm cautiously optimistic but because many governments are responding positively. I think uh, there has been a lot of exposure uh, to uh, how, how, how big the burden of care amongst most women. So all of you, please talk about it so that as we talk to governments, we can get uh, positive responses and action. Thank you, Pumzile, and I, I'm glad that you mentioned um, the new campaign, uh, Generation Equality, because I think that's a really important thing to kind of orient our conversation toward is what is also happening amidst this crisis, but outside in some ways of the crisis where we're, we've got um, powerful initiatives that we can all be part of. So I'd like to invite um, Marlene to respond to this question, not only with regards to, to care, but also how have you seen these burdens distributed within the health sector um, that you're so sort of expert on? Uh, thanks, uh, Zoe. And I couldn't agree more with uh, what Ponzilla was saying. Even Zoom is gender imbalanced, right? It's, uh, so in every aspect of life, we still have to think gender very often. And uh, um, I'm, I'm joining and good morning, evening, afternoon to all of you. Greetings from Kenya, where I'm based. Uh, and number one, the care is really kind of um, um, increasing for women because they are home now. Um, working from home or being at home, unemployed at home, taking care of the children who don't go to school, but or very often also more of the husbands. Some of them are unemployed. They are, um, they are also from home, so all this burden. They are not 
really increasing their kind of part of the household. Uh, lead, it, I think they are just um, very men sitting outside and um, uh, um, looking for company from other men. And uh, so their, their contribution in, in domestic work is not really increased as far as I can see and read. And here it's a hot topic in the, in the Kenya media. media. Within the care sector, of course, in the health sector, most of the care is provided by nurses and midwives. And we see them and, 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 and doctors, of course, clinical officers. And we see that um, it was already gender imbalanced, but even now, even more, if, for example, in, in every hospital in Kenya, in every facility we have, um, nurses who are COVID infected or who are getting unwell because of the burden of the additional work uh, and the stress and the psychological burden as well, especially when you work in this um, IDU and intensive care units, but also in maternal health, we see more, well, I come back to that later, but we see more and more home deliveries because women don't get to the facilities anymore, but then they come to the facilities with very sick, vulnerable newborns. So that pattern has changed. And again, in providing care, it's again more the, the female healthcare providers uh, who are suffering. Although, you know, it's not kind of, of course, also the men, the male doctors and the male nurses take part of that process and we have, had too many colleagues dying in the last two weeks of, um, of COVID. Um, doctors, but also substantial number of nurses, midwives. So yeah, it's a bird. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think we'll come back to some of these health, health sector inequalities and of course also the challenges that are not inherently gendered, which can still pose gendered. Um, problems for men as well. So men, of course, have gender and it's always worthwhile to remind ourselves of, of the fact that there can be male gendered burdens. Um, Cozy, I'd like to bring you in on this question and, and to hear just a little bit about how you're seeing the sort of ripple effects of the care burden in Ghana in particular vis-a-vis um, -vis the private sector and women's participation in, in work and, and kind of income earning activities. So um, thank you very much. I think that um, I'd like to re-echo a lot of what has been said. And I think it's no different from any country or any home. And when you look at what COVID-19 has really done is that it's really brought to light or as I keep saying, it has actually exposed us, <laughs> right? All to structures and institutions that we should have always put in place but never really did support gender equality but for years we've run away from doing. And what this um, our current situation and the pandemic has done is really show us and exposed us that these are things we should really pay close attention to. So as those who spoke before me had mentioned, care is number one. And it's something we cannot really underestimate in the conversations that we are having or even have when we're talking about private sector development and economic development going forward. So in Ghana, if I look at my own home and I look at my own family, my cousins and my sisters and um, some of the entrepreneurs that I work with on a daily basis, the main thing you realize is that a lot of them have had to stay at home to take care of their children, to take care of their old parents and their old family members. And you realize that it's really had a major and a, and a negative impact on the private sector and even economic development. And governments would still see the ripple effect of that when you even talk about taxation and everything else to bring on board a lot of funding to support the work that they do for the economy. And the double burden of what COVID has done, especially when you're looking at it from the gender equity side, equality side, and you're looking at it from the work women are adding on in terms of care, some of, which is work, some of which is what we've always done, is that it's really enhanced and added more work to what we continue to do. If you look at Ghana's economy, 
or a lot of the West African and other African economies, you realize that it's a highly informal economy, which is about 80% of the eco entire economy. And when you look at some of the data we have internally, um, where we have about 800,000 businesses we are working with, and out of that, 70% of them are women who are coming forward to ask for support and get support. You realize that a lot of them have had to close down their shops and um, because it's an informal sector where there's no organization, proper, real proper organization, a lot of them have had to give up their daily sustenance or the work they do to be able to go home and take care of kids who don't go to school anymore or parents they've had to bring closer to them to be able to pay attention to and, and tend to. And that's going to have a major and a massive impact on them. And you saw the ripple effect initially when there were lockdowns because these women and mothers had to stay at home and couldn't go to the markets to either sell. And it was causing major problems at home in terms of even, as we mentioned, there's domestic violence increases. Then you also have um, poverty levels increasing because there's no money to buy food. There's no money um, to take care of children. There's no money to even pay for health care. And when the situation like that arises, then they really have to lower um, what is prioritizing even health care or other care um, for that matter. And so COVID-19 really, in our current situation, has brought to light really the care burden on family, which will indirectly transform and, and, and have a negative transformation impact on the, on the private sector and the businesses they do, because they're spending more time at home taking care and very little time in the marketplaces or in their shops or in their offices, trying to do what to support the private sector to grow and limiting the growth of the private sector, which would eventually have a massive ripple effect on the economy more than we've ever thought about. Because in most instances, we, when we talk about economic development, I think we, we don't really relegate the women at the forefront of it. But in African economies where a lot of the informal sector lies on the, on, on the legs of the women, I think we'll be seeing so much more on that, especially on the local level than on the district levels, due to the fact that they have to pay more attention to given care. Thank you. So I want to turn uh, one more round of questions to the panelists and, and shift us to kind of thinking about what are the policies that are needed um, to address some of these gaps and gendered harms that we've identified. I mean, this is, we've barely scratched the surface and I know that uh, the audience questions will, will raise more issues, but I'll go back in the order that we've just gone. And so I'd like to first um, invite Pumzile to tell us a little bit about what governments can and should be doing to protect women, particularly in the home and from domestic and intimate partner violence. AUC uh, African Union Chairperson Musa Faki said that COVID-19 has accentuated the inequalities and discrimination of vulnerable groups, which includes the more than 50% of Africans who are female. And he, he commented that the confinement and social distancing can transform the haven of peace, which must be the home, into a place at high risk of violation of human rights, particularly the rights of women. So what is the role of government from Zile? And could you tell us as well about some of the civil society initiatives and innovations um, that have strengthened safety and care for women who've been affected by violence? Uh, it, yes, thank you very much. Well, government has have a very big role uh, in addressing violence against women. And maybe just say gender equality in general, because uh, if we look at uh, where progress has been, uh, for instance, in the last 25 years of, imp of implementing the Beijing Platform for Action, uh, where you have seen a, a move, it is where government was targeted, invested, and had policies. And that was in, in uh, women's health and in, in education where increasing enrollment, especially at primary school, was something that especially the poorest governments dedicated their time and policies to. So for violence against women to ever be dented, because right now we are definitely not denting it. It is really, really exacerbating for people like me who do this on a full-time basis. 
uh, we actually need to up the game. Governments need to up the game. And, and I think the, the easy analogy, and we're using this in the 16 days of activism this year, uh, this is the message that we are sending, that we know what a pandemic look like. Uh, we know what you have to do in order to fight it. You need all hands on deck. Gender-based violence is a pandemic. Uh, the intensity of the fight has to be as intense as uh, we have devoted resources, time, etc., to fight uh, the health uh, pandemic. Governments were able, just like that, uh, to close borders, stop us from moving around, uh, dish out money, everything, because this was all hands on deck. Uh, heads of state stopped everything that they were doing because people were going to die. Guess what? Women are dying, have been dying, and will continue to die, not unless we see that level of reaction. I mean, if two people present, one uh, with a life-threatening uh, disease that, that the virus is, we know what to do. The health workers know what to do. And no one is asked, what were you doing? Where were you, et cetera? You do the needful. If someone presents with a life-threatening partner, it's a book-long discussion about things that have got nothing to do with saving their lives. And we do not have the health, the frontline workers for gender equality who are as jacked up as the health workers have been and continue to be risking their own lives. Our frontline workers uh, in ending violence against women who should be equipped are judges, they are prosecutors, they are the police, they are police station, and civil society cannot be the ones who are shouldering the burden uh, under-resourced as they are. But they are enablers and they can help, but they should be I mean, we have not a civil society to save the world from the pandemic. So there is an attitude, a political will, and I think uh, that is where I, I feel we, we are losing the fight and we need to bring our leaders and ourselves into the fight with that level of intensity. Pumzila, I can't thank you enough for that powerful analogy. I know that um, this is a conversation that has been long going for <laughs> feminist activists, women's rights allies, and, and for leaders such as yourself. And to hear it put in those terms of something that is achievable, because our fight against the pandemic is something we imagine to be achievable. That, I think, is, is the cognitive shift and the political shift that you've so um, expertly laid out for us, as if we invest time, energy, and resources, it is something that we can end. Um, so thank you for that. I know we'll have questions from the audience for, for you on these topics. So I want to move now to Marlene. Um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of what is next in thinking about the health system, um, thinking about you know, specifically your area of expertise in ob -GYN, how do you ensure safe deliveries in light of COVID? And are there innovations or changes that can be made because of the pandemic that could have long-term sustainable positive impacts on uh, women's reproductive health care and safe deliveries? Thanks. Thanks for the question, Zoe. And um, yes, uh, before I go there, maybe I can just pick on what uh, Pumzila was saying. Um, it's gender-based violence or the increase is a bit called the shadow pandemic of COVID. And we do research to, um, to study the impact of COVID on um, family planning, on behavior, on maternal and child health, and I can come back to that. Um, but what is clear, so there is still a lot of doubt, um, but what is clear is that the impact of gender-based violence is, is huge. Um, here also in Eastern Africa, we are working already a long time in that area. We have never seen so many cases. Um, one of our gender-based violence clinics, where we have now 8,000 um, survivors over the last years, we know most of them are girls, most of them are very young girls and boys. 85% um, of the perpetrators are family or neighbors. So now we are dealing with even many more. 
of these young girls who get pregnant, who get violated, and they come to the clinic and we give them all the care we can, but finally they go back to their home settings where the violence is, is rampant. So this is really kind of a, a very serious epidemic and we won't find a vaccine or a remedy against violence against women as we will do for COVID. So we need to put that very, very high on the agenda. And also in the work that I did when I was director of WHO, we, we worked very hard on a resolution to get uh, about the, the, the role of the healthcare sector in violence against women and girls. Uh, even there we had to, we started to work in 2014, starting from a UN definition of violence against women, including marital rape, including child marriage. And we had to start taking that out because the diplomats, although it was a UN uh, official uh, definition, the diplomats we were talking to uh, in, in Geneva didn't accept the definition anymore. So we had really to struggle to still work in the plan of action. It's there, but not in the resolution about child marriage. And we see the number of, in the rural areas here in Kenya, the number of child marriages are going up because of COVID. A girl has been raped, she is pregnant, and then the families, they don't take, the, 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 they are poor, they don't take it to court, but they just do the chop chop and the, the kind of uh, the family, uh, it's the chiefs who come for a solu with the solution. And it's the solution is always the girl who goes to live with the perpetrator and gets uh, married as number, wife number four or five, and she is suffering. So this is, this is really dramatic um, since COVID. Um, your other question, what about the impact of COVID um, on, on sexual and reproductive health? So we do a number of um, studies here with communities and, and with the government. Uh, and number one, we expect a baby boom. And it's still, it's already up, uh, going up now, but in a couple of months, even more because of the lockdown and the curfew and, and all these um, mitigation measures and because of difficulties to get access to family planning. So more women are getting pregnant, it's number one. The gains we made in the MDGs and the SDGs with reducing maternal mortality and quality health care and getting women to the hospitals to deliver, we are really concerned that this is going backwards. So we are doing now comparisons to 2018, 2019, and there is still a bit discussion, but that is one of the fears. And due to the fact that uh, there is lockdown, so women, we have more women dying now, right now, because of the, con the mitigation measures that they don't get to the health facilities. Uh, there is no transport. Um, so all these kind of structural problems are now <laughs> aggravated. So women don't get the care they, they need and probably we will see a kind of pushback to and, and all the gains we made. Um, in, and we see, as I said already before, more women are delivering at home and more vulnerable. We don't know about stillbirths yet, but the fear is or the observation that stillbirth is going up poor pregnancy outcome and the newborns, more preterms and more kind of problems, vulnerable newborns who are brought to the health sector. In addition, just before I end, there is really also, it's not only the mitigation measures and lack of transport and so on, but also the really panic uh, and fear in the population of going to the health facilities. So there is so much, um, and we try to tell them you have more, the probability that you get infected is higher on the market and in the supermarket and whatever, but the health facility has this kind of label, they're a COVID in the health facility. So they run away from antenatal care, they run away from hospital deliveries with all the consequences. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for, for sharing that and I think 
you know, when we talk about these big trends and we say, oh, this is affecting women and, and we try to make generalizations, we can sometimes lose the details. And what you've done for us, Marlene, is you've helped us remember that if there's a curfew, for example, in Nairobi, and a woman goes into labor at midnight, she doesn't have control over when she needs access to care. And so some of those small policy changes can have a huge impact on the windows of opportunity by which women can access the care they need and access it in a timely fashion. Um, I'd like to, to turn next to Kosi, if you would tell us a little bit about um, conversations that you've been part of on how to support women entrepreneurs and women in business and across the, the sort of formal and informal sectors, women who are, who are invested in not only building their own careers, but of course, in keeping you know, their family sheltered and food on the table and access to medicine and access to schooling, all of those things that you know, we talk about these big trends, as I just said, but it's just the little things. If you lose that incremental margin of income, that might mean that one of your children doesn't get a textbook. It might mean that one of your family members doesn't get medicine that they need. And so how are you and, and your colleagues in the government talking about and thinking about alleviating this pressure on women's earning capacity and also supporting women entrepreneurs to kind of maintain momentum or gain momentum coming out of the pandemic? Sure. Um, thank you once again. I, one of the things you know, we've been talking about and one of the things that I mentioned have really been highlighted through this pandemic is really also the importance on the conversations between private sector and public sector and the need for government and private sector to engage in better and stronger conversations because all of the work that we do as private sector and the importance of government's interventions really have tend to have a massive impact on how the conversations we are having go. So the first thing really when the pandemic hit and the lockdown happened was for the president to really announce the support to be given to entrepreneurs and MSMEs, the micro, small and medium enterprises in Ghana, which was then the coronavirus alleviation program, the business support scheme, where an amount of funds were committed. And this policy direction, I think, is one of the best interventions that the president really initiated at a time such as this. And the reason why I say that is because if you look at the Ghanaian um, the entire system or the formal and informal sector, and you even look at the numbers we collated during the time when we opened the portal for people to be able to apply, you realize that out of the 850,000 applicants, 70% of them were women. And because we were able to put in place the instrumental um, programs where government had also kept in mind that we needed to look at women entrepreneurs and was intentional about it. Accessibility of our interventions were key to how we're going to implement and even roll out the program. And so government's policy and direction really favored the women entrepreneurs, where out of, as I mentioned, 850,000 plus, 70% of them were women entrepreneurs dotted across the country who had their own businesses, of which 80% were in the informal sector. And so government's intervention was timely because it was just at the time when there was a lockdown and then also when the lockdown was lifted, a lot of them had used their working capital to feed their families. And so there was really nothing to go back to work with, with the exception of government's intervention. So government's role cannot be under, underestimated in this place and got what the interventions and the conversations we had as government. This even led to government bringing and pulling in more resources from other partners and other foundations where the key focus was once again women entrepreneurs because we saw the impact. The case where they've given up so much, they're staying at home, the vulnerable um, um, group where the impact was stronger. And so our interventions then kept looking more at how to bring more women entrepreneurs to the fold, not forgetting men as well, or the youth as well, also in the development of everything, because they were also being impacted. So government really played a very critical role and continues to play a very critical role. And one thing I must say for the advantage of this situation was that it brought to life one of the major plights of women entrepreneurs, which was access to funding and even financial inclusion. And a lot of the intervention that government put in at that time was looking at how best we can address this issue of financial access 
and bringing it to the doorstep of women entrepreneurs, something we haven't done for years and have moved away from because financial institutions and programs have been comfortable just supporting other programs that were general than targeting the interventions. And so this really brought to life the flight of the uh, uh, women entrepreneurs, but also brought a solution. And to me, it's more of a lasting solution because now government is looking at this intervention as how do we widen this program? Partners are looking at it like, how do we actually continue to do this and make it stronger and better? Through this intervention and in government circles around this time, I was looking at also social protection. Um, how do we come up with policies that really strengthen um, and protect you know, the vulnerable and protect women and children at this time? So in terms of what social um, safety nets are we going to bring on board? Um, a lot of the women were, had complained about pensions um, about you know insurance at a time such as this, and these are conversations. Government, which is the policy of coming, bringing these conversations to to private sector as well, because for years the policy interventions had always looked at people in the formal economy, forgetting that majority of the economy was an informal economy, and we're missing out on what the social net, um, the safety nets were, and not really a strong part of it. And so government's conversation with private sector is changing, you know, and Cosi, we may have lost you. Can you hear me? All right, on the off chance that uh, Kosi's connection has dropped, I think I'll, I'll turn to one of the questions from the audience now, and I invite anyone else who has a question to share it um, through the Q&A button. Oh, Kosi, you're back. Okay, great. You can finish. What we, we lost you for just a minute as you were just talking about the way private sector's relationship uh, to government is changing. Yes. So um, as I was saying, so the informal, um, the government realized the need to build a stronger relationship, not more of one where it, it's, it puts in place stumbling blocks to private sector, but really find a conducive opportunity for us to formalize the informal, made up mostly of women who were strongly disadvantaged during the COVID pandemic, but needed so much support to be able to grow, to be able to sustain and even keep their families, right? And so government has been looking at different interventions. And one really critical piece and one really critical policy that government has also really has come up to be able to support a lot of the women entrepreneurs looking at the informal as well has been technology and really digitalization of the economy to be able to bring these a lot of the women who are now staying at home to continue to do the work that they've done in an informal setting right now through a formal setting through technology. And all these have come together to support the work and to make private sector and government realize they need each other. And so policies that support technology and e-commerce, policies that support access to funding and financial support to women um, entrepreneurs and MSMEs are key. For policies that support the social safety net um, support programs that would benefit women entrepreneurs are also very, very important. And these are conversations governments are having for the first time, because they realize that if they don't have this conversation with private sector, if something like this happens again, they cannot even afford to sustain the economy or the women entrepreneurs and give them the opportunity that they could the first time around. Thank you so much. So I'll um, ask a few of the questions from the audience. And I want to start with one that is directly related to what you were just sharing with us, Kosi. And this comes from Anya Geyer. Anya asks, could you comment on what we've learned about women's and children's access to the internet in rural and in urban settings? So I don't know who wants to take that, but I think this is timely as we think about how do you roll out information and support, whether it's for entrepreneurs and small business owners, micro enterprises, or education. Income. 
as, as I mentioned earlier, um, this pandemic really taught us, taught us a few things. The importance of technology, right? That we couldn't have rolled out massive interventions as government or even in the healthcare send information if we did not have technology and the right network. But we also realized one thing that we were hindered, that even though there was technology, there was also limited access. And it's easier for us to sit in maybe bigger cities and um, certain regions and say we have access. But when we were initiating and implementing a lot of programs, we realized that there were so many disadvantaged communities because access to internet and access to certain information was not readily available. So yes, technology plays a big role and is important and has allowed information to disseminate at levels we could never have thought about. But then it also brought to light that there's a huge disadvantaged community outside of what we know who could not access the same information the same way we could. Thank you. Does, any, um, does anyone else on the panel want to respond to this in, a, in another context about how technology and lack of access has affected women's and children's experience of the pandemic differently? Uh, yes, uh, I mean, in communities uh, that are technology poor uh, or technology deprived, um, definitely uh, uh, the children and the communities are being left behind. And because uh, investment in digital infrastructure uh, is not a top priority of the governments who are still dealing with water, uh, health, uh, hospitals, and, 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 and so on. But what the pandemic uh, showed us is that uh, if you put digital infrastructure at the end of the line, the lives of those uh, children who should be uh, having access in at that particular time are being shortchanged because a, a, a girl who's 11 years old will never be 11 again. Uh, their lives are ruined forever. And uh, the chances that uh, they will not do well at school now as we see that uh, the, the pandemic is protracted and we don't know uh, how long uh, we are going to have to wait for the vaccine, etc. And in any case, even if we get the vaccine, uh, it's not whether we're going to have another pandemic, it's when. So the sooner we start preparing ourselves for, for another pandemic, as well as a, a society that is a, a, a equity uh, when it comes to access to information, because technology can exacerbate inequalities as much as it can close the gap. And the more we delay is the more we actually are creating conditions for technology to be a, a, an instrument for making society more unequal. I think in South Africa, if a child uh, is in a school in Sentin, where the school requires them to have an iPad. And we have a child in the rural areas who has to worry about having a desk to sit on. Uh, those children are going to have a totally different life using the same curriculum, having the same IQ. Uh, so, and, and I think this is where we come in as societies. Uh, government in the main, again, but also us as stakeholders, parents, uh, civil society, uh, multilaterals like ourselves, uh, to make sure that these dots are connecting. Absolutely, thank you for that. Marlene, did you wanna to add to this one? Yeah, well? I agree with what the other panel members said, but maybe just to add, here in Kenya, we are lucky that we are quite well digitalized because payment is done with M-Pesa. So everyone, people don't have a bank account, but they pay and they send money to the rural areas and to the family with this uh, on the phone. So almost everyone has a phone, right? Um, um, this is uh, not different from what Mozilla was saying in the, in the schools, but I mean, girls and boys, they have access to kind of some level of digital uh, use of digital tools. 
However, the most vulnerable group in that, um, in that area are kind of older women. Uh, they, they have never been, they've never had access to something like that. They never, so if it is about sharing information, I think youth has not, in the rural areas, has not as much access in, in towns, but still they connect uh, boys and girls. But the adult population and more adult women and older women, they are really deprived of this kind of information, this kind of digital world. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for bringing the generational aspect. I think that's something that's important now and will continue to, to grow and as as a just population. Just to, to add, so we, we try to do um, teleconsultation to spread messages. And the ones who are connecting and who are kind of uh, jumping on these opportunities uh, is the young generation. They find their way, they find information. Uh, but I mean, the older generation, the men, yes, but here we really see a discrepancy uh, with women. So we need to have that vulnerable group uh, in our um, in our targets. Yeah. All right. So we've got a, a few more questions um, from our audience. One that has gotten um, a lot of likes, and if you're not in the Q and A box, you can like other questions. This is one um, from Chris Gordon, and Chris uh, comments that having men around the house creates more work because they create a mess just by existing and not helping. Um, Chris comments, this is a deeper issue than COVID. It requires attitudinal change. It says that unfortunately, many of the most entitled men are created or shaped by their mothers, and I would add by their fathers and other caregivers. How can we address this? It is promoted by culture, by religion, by societal expectations. What is the entry point for addressing a culture of entitlement amongst men and perhaps uh, an expectation of patriarchy. I wonder, um, Pomzile, if you might have the first go at this question of the, the entry point for attitudinal change, not only for men about their own behavior, but for others uh, who love them and would like them to behave differently. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, culture change uh, uh, is uh, a long-term project. There is no easy fix. But it also does not mean that uh, we should not be doing uh, intense work there. But that work should be accompanied by uh, enforceable policies so that change can also be forced. Uh, people do take a cue uh, from their, their leadership, people that they, they, they perceive as the ones who have power in their society. And for us as the as United Nations and different institutions uh, such as uh, where Marianne uh, is, uh, governments are those institutions that we have access to, that uh, we can uh, engage with so that they provide uh, uh, an enabling example uh, of what non-toxic patriarchy is, as well as the uh, sanctions uh, that can protect women from uh, uh, rampant abuse. I mean, if you think about uh, uh, the effects of patriarchy or, or, or racism, um, uh, if you have laws that protect people from those kinds of uh, abuse, they may not make a man to be uh, gender sensitive the way we think it should be, or make a racist person not to be racist, but they, the laws can stop them from acting out their racism and their harmful patriarchy. So in, in the long term, you would want them to, be, to behave properly, not because there's, there's a law, because they have you know, embraced the value system. So you almost need it from both sides. In UN Women Now, one of our uh, area, especially to fight child marriage, FGM, gender-based violence, we are working a lot with traditional leaders. In Africa, we have uh, uh, 
partnered with African uh, traditional leaders and formed a, a Pan-African Organization of Traditional Leaders. And now you have more traditional leaders who are learned, who are university graduates, and they are very helpful. They are passing bylaws in their areas of ju jurisdiction to ban child marriage. They are sanctioning the parents if a child is married off. They are bringing the child back uh, from uh, be, uh, uh, getting the child back from being married and they are supporting ch uh, child marriage survivors by providing scholarships so that sort of it's an unwedding present <laughs> that takes you to school. So I think there is that uh, as an opportunity for us to, to, to invest in. And I have to say in the two in years in particular, when we have been working with these uh, traditional leaders very intensely, I am quite hopeful that uh, this is a constituency that is not to be wasted. So I'm going to slide in one more question for, that's targeted to you, Pumzile, and this comes from uh, Itumilang Lamini, who asks about uh, the role of women policymakers. Itumilang says the, the role of women policymakers in Africa cannot be underestimated, and you yourself were just talking about kind of leaders and, and role models and how that transformation can happen from changing who's at the top. Um, so how can we promote and build the capacity and representation of women in policymaking and political leadership roles across Africa? Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's really something that I think we should be doing uh, more of, much of uh, in Africa especially because uh, even though we still have the many uh, problems of uh, 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 leadership uh, in, in, in Africa, actually uh, Africa has, um, this is one area where there has been uh, more progress and even the statistics about women and leadership in Africa, at least in the public sector, is much better than Asia, for instance, better than Middle East, uh, and in and, and, and Africa, Europe, and Latin America are the ones whose who's, uh, uh, numbers in, in, in leadership. So there is, a, there is an opening there. We need to push further. And we need the women in, in policy making to make sure that uh, they uh, uh, are focused on the policies that will work. We find that uh, countries that are able to sustain women's participation and leadership are ones that have special measures such as quotas and targets, uh, which are uh, uh, enforced. Otherwise, you know, it goes up, it comes down, it goes up, it comes down from election to election. Um, and also you need uh, we, more women because when women are there, uh, they are most likely to look at the issues that impact on women. Uh, women uh, in, the, in the health sector, uh, were not adequately represented in decision making about COVID. And the impact of that, for instance, is the fact that we had a lockdown without a strategy about domestic violence. If you, you would have had more women influencing the, the decisions that were being made, uh, women would have raised uh, these issues. Uh, we have stimulus packages. Uh, about 18% of the money that globally uh, that has been set aside uh, for stimulus packages uh, seems to be targeted and reaching women when women are the majority of those who have lost job. There are not many women who are in, in the treasuries of countries and uh, making those decisions. In addition, a stimulus addresses short-term needs. We actually need the, the stimulus to go hand in hand with the underlying restructuring of the economy and macroeconomy. You need feminist economists to be in the table and to make sure that uh, they uh, uh, are making a case for women. So I must say next year's CSW uh, is focused on women. So please everybody get ready and bring out everything. And we are particularly focusing on women in the public sector because if they get it right, they can be a catalyst for change everywhere because public sector by its nature regulates for everybody. And International Women's Day theme also is a, a leadership of, of women in the times of Corona. 
So let us also help each other with the ideas uh, on how we could uh, uh, support women as policymakers and uh, make sure that they have their, they have their say and their place in the table. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. I'm uh, sad to see our time is up, but I know that you all have um, important things to, to get onto in your, in your day and in your week. So I want to, you know, sort of draw our attention to um, the final question from the, from the audience, which I ask everyone to consider as you go away. We won't answer it in our live conversation. But the question is, how can we sustainably leverage the positive spin-offs from the pandemic? How can we take swift action, allocate resources by government and private sector in a gender responsive way so that women are not always bearing the burden of crisis, but are in fact celebrated for the ways that they are responding to and rising to the occasion? Our next webinar topic in the COVID series will be on youth and closing the innovation gap on December 9th. You can find the webinar schedule on the website africa.harvard.edu. Thank you so much to Pumzile, Marlene, and Kosi for your inspiring and invigorating remarks, for holding us accountable to the most marginalized and vulnerable in society while also lifting up the power and potential of African women leaders across the region. Um, please, if you are joining us in the audience, fill out the post webinar survey. And thank you all again for joining us. Thank you to the Center for African Studies and the Africa CDC for making this conversation possible. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Thank you.